Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, inviting me to come to you again. <coughs> We're going to look at Psalm 49 this morning. If you have your Bible, please turn to it. The theme of this psalm is something that the writer calls understanding. You have it in verse 3, and uh, then again it appears in verse 20, right at the end. And the psalm is a a sort of a corrective to our present-day confusion. If I was to mention the word Brexit, you'd probably begin to get weary. Um, what is, what's the concern underlying Brexit? What well, are the main concerns? Surely it's money, isn't it? Uh, the economy. Will we have less money? Will people lose their jobs? Will the pound crash? Will the economy cave in? Money is central to our ideas of security and, um, and well-being, isn't it? Um, for many people, m- money is not just the key to pleasure. It's the key to their identity. Um, their worth and their status, and their, their, it's their insurance against trouble, isn't it? They've got plenty, then they feel they might just get through the muddle and the complexities of life. And that's particularly the case when God has been eliminated from our thinking. Then we scratch around for another way to cope with life's difficulties, don't we? Again, we measure the value that we place on someone by, for example, the car they drive um, or the postcode they live at. Uh, The designer handbag is much more than just a container for uh, ladies' clutter, if I dare say. It's a token of a woman's place and uh, her position amongst her peers, isn't it? The four-wheel drive Audi Quattro, let's have a go at the men as well. Um, it's more than a safe vehicle to carry the family around. It's, it's the key to his standing on the estate where he lives. See, there's uh, something of this in verse 18, if you, you look at it. Look, that's very interesting, isn't it? It's very contemporary, this. Um, men will praise you. People will praise you when you prosper, when you do well for yourself. You'll be the, the talk of the neighbourhood. He's got a new one. But this psalm turns that scale of values completely on its head and it shifts the focus to something else entirely, to this thing which the psalmist calls understanding. He puts puts understanding above economics because it's in understanding that we find our true identity. Coming back to my title, um, which I didn't mention actually, but the title is... Um, who do you think you are? Maybe you've seen, some of you might have seen a a TV programme with that title. Um, That's a question people are asking themselves today, isn't it? For many people, these are most uncertain times. Everything is in a state of flux, in, in, in meltdown, isn't it? Since the 1980s, there's been a shift from nationalism to globalisation. Um, the world is on the move, uh, Hence, we have the third runway proposed for Heathrow. There are more languages spoken in Walthamstow, apparently, than just about any other place on the planet, apart, perhaps, from Heathrow. Um, The United Nations predicts that by 2050, there will be 200 million refugees and migrants in Europe. That's massive, isn't it? And it's the rate at which it's happening that destabilises us and makes us, an- makes us anxious, isn't it? And there's a reaction against it, of course, isn't there? For example, the, the rise of the far right in Germany, uh, Trump's strap line, make America great again, it's time to build the wall, all these things are evidence of the anxiety that's building through our Western society. And then there's something else to complicate it even more, which clever people call deconstructionism. Don't worry about the words. It's the idea that um, whatever people thought in the past, you can't really trust that today because all views are relative. Everything's changing. You can't learn from history anymore. 
So we have to ditch the past because we couldn't really trust the people who are running it. See, even, even Winston Churchill is getting a bad press today. People say he was a bit of a rogue. And people buy into that very quickly, don't they? You see, through social media, you can completely change history if you get enough hits and enough likes. So what's true for someone now is a matter of personal choice. Live as you choose. No one has the right to tell you how to, how to live your life anymore. It belongs to you. And even a person's identity is negotiable, isn't it? Now, I know it's fashionable to be gay or transgender. Um, for the vast majority who come out, it's a lifestyle choice rather than anything clinical. But it's still a serious issue, isn't it, for, for people in power or in in the, the NHS, for example, and, and education. See, when the roots of our identity become negotiable, then culture begins to unravel, doesn't it? And people polarise. They all take sides with their own particular um, hero, don't they? So we, it's interesting, last week, Martina Navratilova, who was a great tennis player, she's getting it in the neck now because she calls transgender uh, men who become women cheats. So if they're cheating, if they win a tennis match and they're really a man, but then they've reassigned as a woman, should they get a gold medal? Now, what do you think of that? But that's the reality, that's the situation we're facing. And here the psalmist is giving us counsel to try and bring us back to some sort of position of stability in these uncertain times, isn't he? And it goes uh, beyond money, of course. The culture in which, or the culture which he's concerned with is one in which God has been deselected, taken out of the equation, past his sell-by sell -by date. And that's, our, that's Western society today. That's our country today, isn't it? There are all these people who are clamouring to be heard but the church is marginalised, pushed out, silenced. But what, what price do we pay when we go down that road and we wipe out our understanding? In other words, the wisdom. Because I think that's really another, another word that we could use for understanding. The wisdom of the ages, the wisdom that's rooted in God himself, our creator. What, what price do we pay? So this word understanding, as I say, it appears in verse 3, but again, right at the end, it seems to be a theme that recurs in Scripture. Um, it comes in various forms, but I think it's particularly close to the idea of wisdom. Um, and I think understanding here is it's kind of a, a, it's a very big word, actually. It takes in an awful lot of truth. Um, you know, any, anybody watch Doctor Who? Some of you young people certainly do. Some of you do. Some of the adults do as well. Remember the TARDIS, the police box? Well, it doesn't look much on the outside, does it? But it's huge on the inside, isn't it? Now, that's, sometimes Bible words are a bit like that. When you get inside them, you find it covers a whole lot of stuff that you haven't really taken account of. And the Word of God has this amazing ability to speak to different times and different problems and different generations. And it challenges us and it unsettles us, but then it corrects us and it stabilizes us and bring us back, brings us back to where we need to be. And that's the good thing about coming to church on Sunday morning because it's a place of understanding. And Pastor Tom, he has that ability to open up the scriptures, to understand God's word and then apply it to the life of people today so that they feel, yes, this is for me. This, this word is the word which, which satisfies my soul and stabilizes my life. Now, I'm watching the time and I'm going to move quickly now just to bring out three things from this psalm for you to, to take away with you today. Um, the psalm <clears throat> speaks about longings and desires, doesn't it? And, and often the Bible pinpoints these things. Um, so when a young person maybe feels dissatisfied with their life and they feel maybe that they're in the wrong body or something like that, that's a symptom of our loss. The fact that as human beings, way back in Genesis chapter 3, something went wrong. And it's, it's, it's been echoing down through the, 
the centuries ever since. This, this tendency to feel insecure or uncertain, anxious, afraid, those are words which come up, looking for something to give us security and peace. You know, all these qualities, they point to our identity as human beings made in the image of God. So the psalmist, in a clever way, points this out in verse, well, in two places, um, in, in verse 20, but also earlier on as well. He says, man in his wealth, but lacking understanding, is like the beasts that perish. Isn't that a, an interesting way of describing people without God? Without this understanding, life actually contracts. Despite wealth and prosperity and you know, our lifestyle choices and so on, something is missing. We kind of downgrade ourselves. We become less than what we were meant to be. We become like the beasts that perish. We become brutalized. Now, I'm not just talking about being violent, but I'm talking about just living only for material things. You see, if you think about it, the animals are very content just with a material life, aren't they? As long as the donkey gets his hay and the dingo gets his meat, they're happy to be who they are. Human beings need more than that, though, don't they? Human beings have aspirations, longings. Human beings have potential to, to live at a higher level altogether than the animal kingdom. So people, uh, when they've got money, they want to, ex they want to travel or they want a bigger house, or they want to get into the culture and the arts, they want to go to the theatre, or they want to uh, go to concerts and things like that. And this, this tendency in, the hum in human nature points us to the fact that we were made for more than just food and sleep and reproduction. See how the, the psalmist says, man created in honour, but without understanding is like the beasts that perish. So understanding helps to restore our identity. It gives us our place in God's world. It shows us that we were made for higher things than just material existence. It shows us that we have eternity in our hearts, to use the words of Ecclesiastes. You see, the material world will offer you all kinds of alternatives to God, won't it? But none of them can take his place. Which brings me, uh, secondly, our understanding exposes the misleading substitutes. The psalmist here is basically contrasting the men of under or the person with understanding with the person who's only got a big bank, bank account. There's a lot of reference to money and wealth, isn't there, in this psalm. And that's because money and wealth are very important to people. Not only because they give them security and comfort, but because they give them status. They give meaning to their lives, don't they? If they've got a big car and a big house and, a tra and they can travel freely, maybe have four or five holidays abroad a year, then people think, wow, they've really arrived. They're important people. But the psalmist says if they lack understanding, if they don't have this wisdom which unites them to their creator, then it's all hot air, isn't it? And it will come to nothing <clears throat> because they can't take it with them, can they? <clears throat> That's what he says. They have to leave their lands to others. They may have lands named after them, but despite their wealth, they're like the beasts that perish, verse 12. <clears throat> This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. They're nothing less than sheep destined to die. Death will be their shepherd. They'll die without any future, any prospects, any, any hope, any purpose, any meaning because they've chosen to put wealth in the place of life. The life that God intended us to have in relationship to himself. And our culture is preaching to you every week this alternative message that God is redundant, he's finished, and materialism can give you what you want. And poor old Tom has to come here every Sunday and try and redress the balance, doesn't he? 
That's his task. But it's an uphill task. I've been a preacher, and Roger's been a preacher long enough to know that half the time we think we're, the water is slipping through our fingers, if you like. Understanding exposes the misleading substitutes that people build their lives upon. Psalm 73 speaks of people coming to their end unprepared because they've lived only for the things of this world. Some substitutions, of course, work in certain circumstances, like, for example, I'm sorry to humiliate you if you're England fans, but when Wales brought on Dan Bigger yesterday, uh, he did the damage, didn't he? I'm a Scotland fan, so I can kind of gloat. Uh, some substitutions will work, but don't try to substitute anything for God because it will leave you empty and bankrupt in the end. There's a terrible price to pay. To pay. Thirdly and finally, God's word gives the authentic answer to the question, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You can ask that question in all kinds of ways. But this psalm, with its emphasis on truth and understanding and God at the centre, takes you back to your roots. To, uh, it, I suppose we could say it leads you to your place in God's great plan and creation order. It gives you your identity. It provides for you the terms and conditions by which you are to live in a wholesome happy relationship with God. <coughs> How you can be sure that when you leave this world and this short life, that you will be received by your creator into a new world and a better life. Yes, you do have some freedom, but it's freedom within limits, isn't it? Our freedom needs to be consistent with who we are as God's children. We need to have our true identity firmly in place, don't we? So a woman can choose any handbag she wants to, um, but she can't choose her social life over her unborn child. A boy may struggle with gender issues, but the answer is not reassignment, but new life in Christ, which, which teaches us to say no to ungodliness while we wait for the blessed hope. And a, a fragile adolescent is not to be a subject for secular humanist experiments. Understanding gives us back our place. It gives us our identity. It shows us, it answers the question, who do you think you are? When God's word is central to your life, and we've sung a couple of songs this morning to say, to confirm that, when God's word is central to our lives, we can only flourish and prosper in the long run. Make, make the word of God, make your church, make the ministry of, your word, of the word your priority and you will gain understanding and you will be set free from so many of the things which frustrate you and leave you dissatisfied. And you will discover the life that comes through us, through Jesus Christ. And so finally, as, uh, as we draw to a close, the question of fear comes up, for example, in verse 5. Why should I fear? The, the psalmist asks the question. It's a relevant question, but it implies the answer, that we don't need to fear. When God is back in his rightful place... The times in which we live can unravel, but we don't unravel with them. The whole thing could come unstitched over the next couple of weeks with Brexit and all the nonsense and confusion and contradiction of that. But your place will be secure. For time and eternity, God will not leave his children bankrupt. The psalmist in 112 says, verse 7, my heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And that is because redemption is possible. See, it's interesting how the psalmist says, no man can redeem the life of another. You can't do that. 
we're on our own in a sense, aren't we? Your family can't save you on your deathbed. But there is one who can redeem you, who provides for us a future and a hope that satisfies and lasts. So as I close, let me commend to you this understanding, this wisdom from God, which the psalmist celebrates and which he promotes and seeks to commend to us as people in a messy world. He offers us something which can stabilise, satisfy, comfort and secure. Because it's rooted in the eternal God, our Creator, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. Thank you for listening.